Okay, here we go. And we're recording. Right. Hey everybody, it's your two favorite two bald nerds getting together once again, talking about interesting technical topics. Uh, Richard Chapman, of course, as always, is here with me. All right, <laughs> Richard Chapman, what kind of alerts did you work on in your environment? So again, first we're structuring off, this, sorry, we're structuring this as a tech interview, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. Uh, I'll try to, I'll try to answer it as if I'm an analyst. And then once I'm done, maybe I'll, I'll throw some feedback in, or some, not some feedback, but some additional commentary about it as well. How hard uh, is this question so, one to 10 in a technical interview? So this one here is probably for most people, probably a four or five, just because they see these every single day. Um, there's a tremendous amount of alerts that you see consistently every day. For instance, in our environment, uh, a lot of firewall denies, authentication failures, brute force attempts, connection to known malware sites. You know, some of these are, are some of the more common ones that you see on a daily basis. And in essence, you end up, they, they become repetitive and you kind of, Kind of just get used to them and you get to a point of being able to have a very simple system in place to work through it from beginning to end to ensure that the alert that you're getting, which is basically a notification that there's a potential issue, potential rule broken, you're going through and verifying. If that rule was broken, was it actually broken by somebody malicious, somebody trying to do something they're not supposed to be doing? Or is there some sort of other issue here, uh, like a false positive alert where you're getting notified, but realistically, it's not anything that you need to worry about. As a matter of fact, in those cases, you might want to try to tune those out so that you don't get those alerts on a regular gotcha. basis. All right. So clearly, I mean, you know, part and parcel of working in a SOC is dealing with uh, all these different types of alerts. So do me a favor, Richard. You've got thousands. Just pick one of them and tell me how you analyze and respond to it. Yeah, a brute force is an easy one to kind of look at because usually when you're looking at the, the data, it's pretty self-explanatory. When I get an, a, an event, an offense an, or an alert, um, it's going to notify me that on this date at this time, uh, we saw this kind of activity. In this case, this would be a rule broken of a brute force attempt. So in other words, if I were to try to log in more than a certain period of uh, more than a number, a certain number of times, the alert is triggered. For instance, if I have a threshold of six times, if I attempt to log in more than six times in a short period of time, a given period of time by the rule, it will basically create an offense or an alert that an analyst would go look at and verify. Is this legitimate login attempts where somebody just forgot their login? Maybe it was a password reset time of the, of the, of the year, um, or maybe they just had a really good time and forgot their password uh, you know, because they had too much to drink the night before. I don't know. Uh, whatever the case may be, it's our job as analysts to look at it. And to basically try to get a feel for what's going on with it. That's so, Well, yeah. all right. Well, let, let's let's uh, zero in on this just a little bit more, and uh, yeah. let's talk about one particular issue that is I don't know for me it's it's red hot on a personal basis is phishing, and mm. uh, so walk me through kind of a, a scenario of you becoming aware of some form of alert, and I'd like a little detail on that if you don't mind. Like yeah. uh, it'll, what, what kind of alert are you getting? How does that manifest? And then uh, what are you going to do now that you realize that this is a legit uh, incident? What do you do about it? What's the investigation process? Absolutely. So uh, first off, let me add one more thing to the brute force uh, before. One big indicator uh, with brute force attempts is the number. You know, if you if you see a, a, a smaller number, you know, five to ten uh, attempts to log in, that actually does look more like legitimate type login activity. If you see thousands, that is clearly uh, an attempt to brute force their way in. I, I don't I, know, Richard, because, you know, when I when I forget my password, I forget it with a plum. You keyboard bash the snot out of it, don't you? I, I, I'm, I'm sure I've typed in passwords that I was using in, in 83, but... Uh... <laughs> nice. Okay, uh, going back to the phishing email. Uh, phishing email is obviously a, a huge, huge deal right now. As a matter of fact, I think uh, the last time I read something like 50% of major attacks are beginning from a phishing email. There are a it. lot of things you can see in an email which indicate that it might be malicious, you know, poor spelling, poor grammar. So if you're doing manual phishing emails, which to be honest, not a lot of companies are really doing other than maybe smaller companies that don't have a budget for something like a proof point, uh, you know, a higher end email security tool. Um, when you look at the, the, the poor grammar, the poor spelling, uh, when you hover over any links in the email, 
and the, the site that it's taking to you or taking you to doesn't really line up, those are all indicators of a potential phishing email. And those are items that we actually kind of have to train our users on because users have to be able to identify that. Absolutely. If in an environment you have a phishing email that gets past the email security tool and that user sees that email, hopefully they're not just taking it at face value. Hopefully they're kind of looking at it a little more in depth. But as an analyst, if you are doing manual phishing email, you would actually uh, gain or gather the header from that email. And then you would start looking at things like the DKIM, the SPF. You would look at the, the, the IPs that are involved in the hops and verify, do those make sense? Are any of those malicious? Are any of those associated with any sort of uh, phishing campaigns or known phishing uh, email senders? The, the, sender them, the sender itself, the email of the sender, is that something that can be verified as legitimate or potentially malicious? There's a lot of different things that kind of have to align for the email to be able to be determined as legitimate. Now, the great thing about the tools is they do a lot of that work on the back end for us, but then we still as analysts have to go in and look at it and see, did anybody click on the links? Did anybody download the malicious files themselves? So there's still analyst uh, requirements even with the tools in place. They're just doing a lot of the basic work to actually sometimes even keep it from getting to the user. Because a lot of times that's where the problem is with the user. So gotcha. hopefully, hopefully that answers some of your questions there. Absolutely. I, I, it's a, well, you know, it's just, it's interesting. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about getting into management is I don't th remember the last time I had to actually go into an SMTP server and do anything. And, you know, <laughs> here you're talking about some pretty uh, funny DNS settings that uh, I was like, I've done that once, you know, but right. then I fell asleep. <laughs> Or something I don't fall asleep on is open source intelligence. OSINT, I, I don't know about you, Richard, but once people find out you're into computers, literally one of the first things they're going to ask you to do other than fix their iPhone is they're going to ask you, you know, can you get all this information about people, yeah. right? And the answer is yes, and I use open source intelligence to do it. No. But the problem is, is then the user's like, oh, show me OSINT. And I'm like, you might as well ask me to just show you history because <laughs> it, it's it's such a huge topic and everybody's got their own way to do it and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And the more I've learned and discovered and play with OSINT, the worse I am at getting other people's information. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's just that you get really lazy. It's very easy today when you're trying to, you know, do a background check on a potential employee or something using tools like, I don't know, like Ben Verified, if you ever seen any of these, mm -hmm. more like, in, you know, not OSINT really in my, I guess technically they are OSINT, but are they? Yeah, there's different levels or different classifications, yeah. I think now of OSINT, you know, in, in, I would say probably five plus years ago, when people were talking about OSINT, a lot of times they were actually referring to digital forensics type stuff. Uh, which is a different level of OSINT, but there are so many tools out there now that are being used actively every day for investigations. They, there's almost like a different level of OSINT, you know, things like virus total and abuse IPDB. Oh, wait, 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 wait. let me get notepad up here. Uh oh, you got to write them all down. Listen, there's so many OSINT tools out there. Honestly, I couldn't list them all, but usually what you find is that you get um, a certain amount of OSINT tools that you use all the time, you know? Um, so you kind of get used to certain ones and you have your workflow and those tools are almost bookmarked. They're saved on your computer and you pretty much, you go to them every time. Like for instance, in that phishing email investigation example a minute ago, you know, for checking the IPs, I would definitely go to Virus Total, Abuse IPDB, Central Ops, uh, IBM X Force Exchange. You know, I might go out there and check and see what they all say. And they're gonna give you different answers, which is interesting. Uh, you'll find that some of them are really fast at updating. Some of them are really slow. Um, some of them give you really nice information. Some of them are a bit more vague. So it just kind of depends, but uh, open source intelligence is something that's actually used all the time. And speaking of being able to use open source intelligence to find people, my mom just had me do something for her. So I totally feel that pain, by the way. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Because you're like, how would you feel about somebody doing this to me? And yeah. be like, well, you know, I mean, it's public information. You know, it's not, you know, I, I don't have anything too scary, right? Uh, yeah, it's surprising how much information is really out there if you know where to look for it. 
I told them I'd shoot. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, I, I have uh, the reason OSINT is of particular interest to me, Richard, is I've been playing with it on my own a lot lately, just as a mm -hmm. side gig. And uh, uh, it's a frustrating field, to say the least, in my opinion. It's the plethora of tools and all the halfway intermediary tools that are supposed to help you, you know, type in a phrase and it goes through 17 different kinds of, uh, of uh, what you do we call it, uh, Facebooks and stuff. Uh, right. And uh, I, I just, one of these days I'll get it right. So you can tell I'm in the frustrating part of OSINT learning right now. All right. I got one more question for you. All right. And this yeah, is the. Uh, yeah, I know you feed me these questions, Richard, but I find them fascinating. I, I guess I'm early enough in my process that uh, uh, I cannot make better questions than these. So let's move over to EDR, all right? So tell me your experience with EDR tools. And uh, in, in particular, keep in mind, we're talking about like, a, this is a tech interview, right? So I'm going to treat you like the interviewee here a little bit. So yeah. uh yeah, this I say, hey, Richard, I see here you've uh, talked about some EDR tools here in your resume. Uh, CrowdStrike and Sentinel One. Tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So it, just so you know, on a, on a scale of zero to 10, um, I, I would actually consider these for a lot of people to be really tough um, just because you have to have worked in them to be able to compare and contrast, number one. And number two, also being comfortable to be able to walk through in your in your mind. When I'm explaining these tools, I'm actually walking through doing an investigation in my mind, right? And we've, we, you and I have spent some time on EDR, so we spent some time with CrowdStrike. But if I'm answering this in an interview, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, you know, most of my, uh, most of my investigations are generally done in CrowdStrike, but I do have Sentinel-1 experience as well. Uh, they're both great EDR tools. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, they both, in, in essence, are doing the same thing. They're looking at the endpoints. They're looking to see if any files are downloaded, any activities that are happening on those endpoints uh, potentially could be malicious. But they they both have their pros and their cons. For me, my brain actually works a lot more like CrowdStrike than it does Sentinel One. It just flows really nicely. You know, when I click on the uh, alert itself and I go into the actual dashboard and I can see the executive uh, summary details over on the right hand side. I can see, you know, who the user was, what the device is, the date, the time. Uh, I can see the command line of the actual file that is uh, potentially malicious. I can grab the hash right there and go look at uh, OSINT uh, information on virus total or one of the other ones that we have like hybrid analysis that's linked to it. I can go through step by step and see all those activities and figure out, does this make sense? And also I can see real easily, did the tool do anything? You know, if there's, if I, I can see my severity level by the color of the bad, of the main alert badge. Um, if it's, you know, red or if it's like that purplishy pink color, I know I've got a higher critical I got to look at. But if I see a green badge there, well, then I know that CrowdStrike actually did some action. You know, it, it either, you know, blocked and quarantined that file, uh, you know, so it, it's, you know, it's not as much of an issue or, or something like that. Sentinel-1, one big difference that I like with Sentinel-1 is it actually has it broken down into uh, static and dynamic alerts. And the static alerts uh, will, are based off a of signature. So if a, hash hap if a hash happens to be malicious, it immediately is going to take action. But if it does dynamic, you actually, as an, as an analyst, can go in and actually do kill and quarantine. You can even uh, go in and do remediate and roll back, which is really nice for an analyst. Uh, if it's a device that they do have the ability to do that on, you know, a non-server, uh, they can go in and do a lot more, which is really cool. But yeah, EDR technology is fun. It's, it's actually probably one of my favorite investigations to do in a, in a SOC. Fantastic. Man, Rich, I got to tell you, these are... These are more challenging questions than I would have thought that one would have to be ready for in a tech interview. Uh, it's, it's a little because they're than, open ended. Yeah, it's a little different than like the Security Plus because like a, with the Security Plus, it's almost like a here's your question. The answer is pretty, pretty. I, I hate to say self explanatory, but it's really kind of there. You know, you either know it or you don't kind of thing. You know, what does DNS stand for? You know, what, what is TCP IP? I mean, that, that's, that's pretty straightforward a lot of times, but when, when you're talking about these, they're technical, but they're also uh, experience. You know, you, you can't talk about them in a technical level if you haven't actually used them. Fantastic. 
Wow. Well, that was a good one. Again, my problem is, is I want to just keep extending this talk. I, I have about a million questions about CrowdStrike. So, Richard, can you uh, promise me we can do just more of a CrowdStrike-centric talk? Yeah, I, I'd absolutely. look forward to that. Fantastic. Sir, thank you so much. I'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you.